Okay, everyone, uh, welcome. It's wonderful to see so many people logged in today, which we, it's our largest number by far for, for a, a Zoom meeting since we started these Zoom talks. So welcome to everybody, to members, to new members that we've got and, and quite a large number of visitors, um, including somebody even from a crofter from Ardner Merkin. So I think that's pretty good going for us for today. Um, because there are so many, for the first time, rather than at the end, um, David taking questions just with us checking who's got their hand up, um, we're asking if you've got a question, if you could actually put it in the chat facility. Um, and the little chat facility you can find on the bottom of your screen, in about the middle, there's like a little speech bubble and it says chat. And if you press on there, down the right hand of your screen, you will, you will see um, a sort of piece open up and you can type in the question uh, and then I will pick them up from there um, and ask David them and probably amalgamate some together if they seem as though they're, they're similar questions. Um, so I hope that's all right with everybody. So now I'd just like to introduce Dr. David Johnson, although I don't think he will need a lot of introduction to very, very many of you. Um, and we're really pleased that he has been prepared to make this talk uh, available via Zoom. I mean, we booked him a very long time since, long before we'd ever heard of something called COVID. Um, and he was just going to do it a normal talk. And we're, we're really, really grateful that he's been agreed to do this by Zoom and it's his first Zoom talk. So we're, we're very, very pleased. Um, as you will know, he's one of our vice presidents. Um, David Lee leads our annual outing and has done for a number of years. Unfortunately, we missed it last year, but hopefully we'll have another. Um, and he's lectured for many years about many aspects of the history of the Yorkshire Dales, um, in particular lime kilns. He's led archaeological digs. Um, he's published an, a number of books, many of which we've got on our bookshelves here at home. Um, and the Trust um, were very pleased to be able to publish his last two, which were Time Please about the Lost Inns of the Dales um, and the one about Settle History. Um, and we published those in conjunction with Stories with Stone, in Stone um, and both are still available if you haven't got your copy yet. So I'm now hand over to David. Am I... You're it. You're on, David. I'm on. I can hear you. Yep. Right. Now I've got to get the presentation up. As uh, Pam said, this is my first Zoom talk, and my mouse has just decided to go on strike. Um, so you want uh, you want the, share screen. Share screen. And then you should see the picture of the presentation. Yeah. That's it. Bingo. Well done. Well, right. Anyway, good evening, everybody, formally. My involvement, if that's the right word, in droving goes back to when I was a kid. A, a, a sort of, I don't know, a pre-teenage kid. And I don't know how many of you remember, there was every year for about seven or eight years, there was an American... TV series on British British TV and it's something that I every time I would not miss it no matter what homework bedtime blah 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 I was going to watch Rawhide which I hope uh, some of you will remember um, and if you if you did watch it and if you can remember it Clint Eastwood was one of the key characters he was the, the ramrod uh, which is an American term or the foreman, I'm going to come back to what, we, you know, the words we used in this country. Basically, Rawhide was following a, a drove of God knows how many cattle from Texas to Missouri. And uh, as I said, I, I just found it fantastic. And, and the, one of the key phrases, which I've never forgotten, was when we're about to move off, it was, head them up, move them out. There's a, another link, before I get onto the talk, there's another link which came in in my first job. And I started off life 
in Africa teaching as a teacher. And one of my first nicknames, and I think you probably think it was obvious this was my nickname, it was Clint, as in Eastwood. Droving is a huge topic. That goes without saying, doesn't it? It's an absolutely huge topic. And this, all I can do tonight is really just scratch the surface. Otherwise, we'd be here till, well, till the cows come home, I suppose. The picture there on the screen, if you're thinking, is that Langstrathdale or is it Malastang? Or, uh, it's a shot from a film made in 2005 called Broke Back Mountain which was supposedly based in Wyoming, but in fact, it was shot in Alberta. And there's a reason why I've started with a shot of two cowboys, as we call them, with cattle there. I'm not going to tell you what that reason is, but you might want to think about that. When you get bored of listening to me at some point, you might want to think, what, why on earth have I put a, a picture up there from America? Well, let's get into the tour. Oh. Why are you not moving? Just press. I, I, the, my, my mouse just decided to, to uh, go on strike for a minute. There's a little bit from one of John Clare's poems from the Shepherd's Calendar, July, which he wrote in 1827. And some of those words, as you're reading through them, are going to magically change colour. Why has that come up? The, one, the words there that I've highlighted in red are ones that um, I want to sort of focus on for a minute or two. Along the roads. Don't, if you have, if you've ever thought about it, don't think of a drove road as being a road contained by walls or hedges or fences or whatever. I don't know why, but maybe when John Clare was writing, maybe road was, it was a you know, very gen generic term, but think of a, of a line from A to B. Don't think of something with a hard, necessarily with a hard surface. Don't think of something contained within walls, as I say, or, or hedges or fences. Drovers, would avoid surfaced roads as much as they could. Then so along the roads in passing crowds, there are some uh, things you read from, you know, late, 19, late 18th century, early 19th century contemporary pieces talking about thousands or tens of thousands or 5,000. Those numbers have always got to be taken with a, with a pinch of salt. But certainly from hundreds, within the hundreds, is what you are normally looking at. So followed by dust, uh, depending on the time of the year, of course. Scotch droves of beast. Cattle were invariably called beasts rather than cattle. Little breed. They were Galloways, they were generally speaking Galloways, black Galloways, which are much smaller than most cattle that you see today. Noticeably smaller. So Scotch troves of beast, a little breed in sweltered, weary mood proceed. You're talking with long distance droves or medium distance droves of day after day, week after week in some cases, of just plod, 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 plod. And not only the, the cattle, but the, the people looking after the cattle would no doubt have got very, very weary, particularly if it was cooking it down or freezing cold or snowing or whatever. The patient race from Scottish hills. Droving, of course, didn't just originate in Scotland. A lot of cattle came from Wales. A lot came from Ireland. And then the last bit there, to fatten by our pasture rills. The idea was that the drovers moved cattle from A to B, possibly via, or from A to Z, possibly by B, C, blah, blah, blah. And before they got to the market, they would make sure that the cattle were fattened up. Because if you've had cattle on the, on the hoof for weeks, they're going to be pretty, 
thin, pretty tired, but they were fattened up before they were sent off to the uh, to the actual fair to the market. So that just that what six lines there. There's a heck of a lot of detail in there. What is wrong with this mouse? Definition there at the top of. Uh, the very simple definition of droving, it's simply the driving of farm animals to market. It's not just cattle, it could be sheep. And I had a friend who has been dead for quite a few years now, who grew up at Arco Farm, which has now long since been demolished by Arco Quarry. He grew up there with his grandparents in the 1930s. And he told me once when, when he was a lad that, I don't know how many times, I can't remember, but he and his granddad would drive the geese through a bed of tar and then walk them to the market in Lancaster. I can't imagine driving geese through a, through a yard, never mind all the way to Lancaster. And that um, by Creighton Webster from that book on the farming of Westmoreland, um, he wrote in it, every spring there's a great exodus of stock from Westmoreland to the great grazing district of Craven. Westmoreland had a huge cattle rearing industry, but of course, most of the cattle coming down from Scotland were also coming down from Westmoreland. And most of the cattle coming from Ireland were also coming down through Westmoreland. So more of this later. And Craven was one of the uh, areas, the places where, you know, renowned for not only sales, but also for grazing of cattle. How old is the, the droving? How far back does it go? When those red numbers pop up, that's just uh, a, a, for me to look at my idiot notes. Archaeological excavation some years ago, this century, but some years ago, um, discovered that from, this is marine archaeology, found that cattle were being shipped from Hengisbury Head. Probably they reckoned that they were brought on the hoof from Devon, possibly Somerset, to Hengisbury Head and then shipped across to Brittany. And that the radiocarbon dating of things in that uh, ship, that wooden ship, dated to the first century BC. So cattle droving is not something of the 18th or the 19th century. It goes back at least you know, into the first century BC and no, no doubt even further. And that second point there was a charter recorded between 1186 and 1201 um, for a road called Galwith Gate, Galway Gate, Galway Road, Galloway Road. And if you've got OS maps, of this area there is still a Galloway Road isn't there going from um, the road that comes over from Dent Head to Garsdale Head coming over the top towards Newby Head and there's a, a road which is still called it's in Westmoreland it's still called the Old Scotch Road we'll come back to later and that is the Galloway's Gate the Galloway's Gate of that charter so it's got a long gestation period the first documentary evidence is a letter of safe passage to two Englishmen from the government of Scotland, the Crown of Scotland in 1359. And they were allowed to buy horses, cattle and oxen and to drive them down into England. Now the 14th century, you know, that, that must have, how, why they were doing it then, I can't imagine. You've had the Black Death. And, and years and years of, of horrendous weather and, and, and disease and whatnot, but they got the safe passage. Um, but that's about that's the only record from those early periods and how much war, you know, the constant wars between Scotland and England affected it, not to mention border reeving. Well, I guess we'll never know. But the a big boost to droving especially cattle droving, came in the 16th century when uh, up, to, up to the 16th century, people didn't drink cow's milk, they drank sheep milk by and large. 
But in the 16th century, for whatever reason, cattle milk replaced sheep milk. So that was a huge boost in demand for cattle. And in the reign of Edward VI and Elizabeth, uh, there were statutes at large issued. The 1562 is early in Elizabeth's reign, and both of those monarchs' statutes said that anybody who wished to be a drover had to be licensed annually, had to be at least 30 years old, had to be married, and had to be a householder. So they weren't going to have any sort of unmarried riffraff age 25 or 29. Being being a, a drover, they had to, to fit those criteria. And then a bit later in Elizabeth's reign, Scotland put a ban on exports of cattle from Scotland to England. And I put a little question there, why? When I, I've given this talk, I think two or three times, you know, face to face with an audience. And I've, at this sort of point, I've, I've asked the audience, what do they think? Why? You answer, you tell me that question. We can't do that tonight, obviously, so I, I'll answer that question. But there will be two points further on where I'm going to ask you something and hopefully somebody, when we get to the chat at the end, can uh, come up with the answer, apart from the one with, with America. The reason why Scotland banned exports of cattle was because there was a desperate shortage of cattle in Scotland. Simple as that. Too many were being sent south. And it wasn't because there was a shortage of beef in Scotland, it was because there was a shortage of hides. And the leather trade was being decimated in Scotland because they just, there just weren't enough cattle to, to kill to get the hides from them. A few dates there. Um, sort of a little local emphasis or vaguely local emphasis. 1639 there's a record there of a chap called George Slinger who was a drove of Beckermans is now Beckermans in Langstrothdale. So he, he lived at Beckermans and in 1639 he married his sweetheart Catherine Thompson who lived at Burnsall but he was a drover and to be listed in the parish records as a drover in the early 17th century was quite rare. And then 1658, Broth, that's Broth in Stainmore, in the burial registers, there was reported the death of William Munkus, who was listed in the, in the burial registers as the driver of beast. He wasn't a local chap, he was on a drove. And there was a, one of the huge fairs was at Broth Hill, just to the west of Broth. And he just died for whatever reason. And then 1662, a farmer in Furness was reported to have paid six pounds, which is a lot of money, for a black bees, a black beast, that's a black Galloway cattle, cow. And then that same year, the, the records, the toll records at Carlisle recorded that number of head of black cattle passing through Carlisle, each paying eight pence per, for the toll. Laws are made to be broken, aren't they? There's no point having rules if you can't find a way of breaking it. And theoretically, any cow coming down from Scotland had to pass through Carlisle. And then again in the 1667 there, there were the orders. This is the English government. Imports from Ireland were banned and that lasted for more or less 100 years. Now, the reason why was because Irish cattle were being sold much more cheaper than cattle from, from Scotland or from England or from Wales, and it was undercutting the market. And I guess maybe there's a bit of politics in there as well. And those two little photos at the bottom, I don't know if any of you know where they are, but the one on the left is in the centre of Carlisle, and the one on the right is just outside the centre of Penrith. So they are perpetuating routes that were, but you know, the, the drovers passed along. 1731, James Barrow of Meathup, across in um, the sort of Kendall area. This is a nice little um, record there. To use and exercise the art and mystery of a drover. 
So he was, he was, you know, he got the license as per the 1560s statutes to exercise the art and mystery of a drover, but, but within the county of Westmoreland. And then um, Eden Hall, if you don't know where that is, it's just to the northeast of Penrith. The hall has been demolished. Um, but the estate records, the survival of the estate records is just phenomenal, particularly for that early part of the 18th century. And I've just got um, a couple of records which I think are worth giving you because it, it tells you when in the year droving was taking place and also what kinds of numbers were involved. So in 1712, and, and the, the Eden Hall estate, by the way, leased out or rented out grazing. So people could come down there, sort of book in advance, as it were. And, you know, we're, I'm, I'm bringing down 150 cattle and we'll get there on 2nd of March, whatever it is. I want some grazing. So the space would be there for them when they came, when they landed up. So in 17, this is through the whole of 1712. 11,267 cattle grazed overnight on the Eden Hall estate. That's a lot. And 180 sheep. Now, those 11,267 plus of sheep, they were in 25 separate droves. So that's over the course of the year, 25 separate droves overnighted on Eden Hall Estate with their 11,000 plus cattle. And the months when they were there, eight in May, seven in June, six, uh, seven in August and three in October. Not in winter. And most of those, this is in the accounts for this Eden Hall Estate, and they didn't pay for the overnighting, obviously they had to pay. They didn't pay for the overnighting when they overnighted. They either paid for it in advance or they paid for it when they were on the way back. They got down to wherever they were going, sold the cattle, got the money, put the money in the swag bag and came back and paid their debts, you know, going back, ticking off, yeah, pay that one, pay that one, pay that one. A lot of it, a lot of this um, droving was done on trust. An awful lot was done on trust. For that year, 1712, 11 of the droves had less than 100 cattle, 28 had between 100 and 200, one had 600, which to drive 600 cattle hundreds of miles just, just beggars belief. And what they paid the Eden Hall estate in 1712 varied from 1.21 old pennies to 1.49 old pennies per head. Why, how you get 1.21, goodness knows. So, you know, there's a lot of detail there. Um, and I'm not going to read them out, but I've got records here for the years from 1735 to 1743. Of the the how much income it was a, it was a major source of income for Eden, from Eden Hall Estate, and um, in the uh, in 1765, 23rd of January 1765, the estate steward at Eden Hall wrote to his master, Sir Philip Musgrave. The, the main seat of the Musgraves was uh, Kempton Park, which house has also been demolished. And their other house at Hartley near Kirby Stephen has also been demolished. So this letter, January 1765, the steward was writing to Sir Philip at, down there and he said that he intended to have the grass on the two meadows at Eden Hall, quote, eaten off with drove cattle. So it was, it was not just a source of income for the estate and, and other landowners as well. It was a way, particularly in January, of getting grass eaten off so that, you know, to, to 
boost the uh, the growth of the new grass once the weather got warm enough. So it was, you know, it was a major, major, major trade. Number three there, really, John Brearley was in the wool trade in um, Wakefield. He was a, a frizzer, wool frizzer in Wakefield. And in 1760, 1758 to 1762, he made several journeys into Craven. I like the sort of his grand tour. And he kept very detailed diaries. And these diaries have survived. And he, he obviously sat in the, in the inn at night having his ale or whatever, or his port, just making notes about what he was observing. And one entry in his um, diary, I'll, I'll read it out, and this is where maybe there's a pinch of salt involved. So it goes, from Skipton in Craven and Gisborne and Settle, there is 1,000 and 10,000 of Scoth cattle driven into the south of England towards London and Norwich and Norfolk each year. So he, he must have been earwigging drovers in wherever he was staying on that particular night. So 1,000 and 10,000, 11,000 cattle per year driven all the way from Scotland down to, some went direct to London, to Smithfield, but an awful lot went to East Anglia. And, uh, the sort of the north part of Norwich and also Suffolk coast. And another interesting link, I only found this out about 10 years ago from my parents. When they retired, they retired to Suffolk coast and they lived on a little estate. And that little estate, I found out, had been the place where the cattle were fattened up and sold, driven down from Scotland and through the Dales or wherever to there and then after winter, sent on to Smithfield. Um, number four there, the uh, statute was repealed and new regulations came in. I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but um, in the, you may have come across the gen, what's called the Gentleman's Magazine, an 18th century, uh, not a, it wasn't a magazine. Um, these regulations came in in 1772, the result of mistreatment of animals, the cattle. And it was a bit like the same, you know, the ones from Elizabeth. All drovers had to be licensed and registered. They had to wear a uniform. They had to have a badge on their sleeve, which had their number. Remember when bus drivers had numbers, a little badge with their number on them, when we, some of us were kids. So they had to have a badge with his number and also the name of his boss or the initials of his boss. And if any drover was, was reported for ill-treating cattle or using sticks to prod them, they faced three months imprisonment with hard labour and a fine of 20 shillings. So these 1772 regulations were pretty, pretty stringent. Uh, I've already mentioned number five. Number six, Thomas Hurtley. Some of you will know that. He wrote, know him rather, wrote, wrote on Malham, didn't he? Malhamdale. He, I sigh, started a myth, what to me is a myth that's been perpetuated right up to the present day about John Bertwistle. And I'm sure you know the name, you've heard the name John Bertwistle, and it's a a little ginnel in at the bottom of the high street in Skipson called Bertwistle's Yard, I think. And the myth that's been put about, you know, there's been a lot of sort of romanticization of droving. And I don't think there's anything romantic about droving. But there's also been romanticization about on Bertwistle, about what a wonderful man he was. And he was in the Highlands in 1745. And I used to think, gosh, how brave to be in the Highlands in 1745 with what was happening there in the, you know, the, the run up to Culloden. But when you start digging deep, John Bertusel seems to have been a bit of a 
I don't know, a bit of a Trump character, dare I say that. He had a lot of land <coughs> in uh, between um, Buckelba, if you know Buckelba to the east of Settle, and on the end of the road going from Settle over to um, Malamdale. He had a lot of land there where he grazed cattle. And when they were doing the turnpike road, he had a contract, the turnpike road between Skipton and Settle, he had a contract. And when you look at the records of the turnpike trusts, they, were, they had no end of trouble with him. He just didn't do what he was supposed to do. He was shoddy workmanship, blah, blah, blah. Um, but um, he, was, he was a big player. He was a big player. And he, and he was the one who ran, quote unquote, the great close fairs and the great close fattening grounds at Malam Tarn in the second half of the 18th century, along with his uh, two of his sons. But he was not the nice chappy he's been sometimes made out to be. And then, say in that same year, John Blake, a Scotch drover, Scotts drover, sorry, a, a, a drover of Scots cattle from Wensleydale, met an untimely death in the turnpike houses in Staymore. It's on the A66, in fact. But the record didn't say what he died of. Oh. <clears throat> That's from W. H. Pine's wonderful book of costumes. Uh, this is his of Drover at Smithfield. And this follows the 1772 act precisely. He's got his badge there on his left arm with his number 127. The initials of his, his bot, his principal, it looked like SN. I don't know who that would be. Uh, rather jaunty hat there, rather nattily dressed. He's got his dog there, it's a scruffy looking dog. And if you compare the way he's dressed with the other three people there, um, he's obviously higher up the, uh, the hierarchy than, than they are. And you've got sheep and cattle there. Whenever I see this, I always think of Julian Clary for some reason. Now, coming back to Bertusel and going up to the Highlands as far as Lewis Harrison's sky in 1745, and there was another, a, a Scots drover who had come down to Craven in 1746, or presumably set off in 1745. The reason I, I said that you know, this, there's nothing romantic about this, about him and his involvement of this, nothing brave at all about it. When the Highlanders were being hammered by Lowland Scots, by the English government, because of you know who, you know, the, the Jacobin Rebellion, the troops were either ordered to or took it upon themselves to raid farms in the highlands and just drive off the cattle. And the records of driving off sometimes in the scores, sometimes in the hundreds, and thousands of cattle on government orders, British government orders, English government orders, thousands of cattle stolen from the highlanders who were being hammered murdered, raped, had the houses burnt, blah, 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 to raise money to pay for the, the government troops up there in, in uh, Scotland, in the Highlands. And people like Bert Whistle, busy with that unnamed Scots drover, went up there because cattle were going dirt cheap. You know, compared to what they would pay normally, the cattle were going cheap because the government wanted a, wanted a quick book. Um, so that, that thing from the elite mercury there, you know, the greatest dealers and grazers in the kingdom. You know, there's, there's uh, to my mind, quite a big pinch of salt there needed. John Morehouse was from Skipton, by the way. <coughs> well, he was up in the sky 20 years later. Cattle in Scotland were sold at trysts and fairs. Trist, I think, John Asher might be able to correct me. Maybe you can nod 
if if I if this is correct or shake his head if not or whatever. I think Trist might be this is a guess, a lowland Scots for trust. That would be my guess, David, but um I, I would need to look it up. I've tried to look it up and not not found anything, but but it 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 could well be because as I said earlier, a lot of it was done on trust. And the up till about 1770, the main tryst for the whole of Scotland was Creef, which I think is in Perthshire, isn't it, on the edge of Perthshire. Uh, but from about 1710, Falkirk began to um, be developed. And after 1770, Falkirk basically drove Creef out of existence. So Falkirk, taking the cattle, all the cattle coming down from the highlands and the islands, they went to Creef and then to Falkirk. Cattle were coming from uh, Galloway or from Ireland, and the, the main cattle fair was Dumfries. So those those three were the main trysts, where over a course of a year, tens of thousands of cattle would have been sold and moved southwards. You can imagine what it was like. You know, Appleby during horse fair time would have been like a Sunday picnic compared with Creek and Falkirk when the, when the fairs were on. I've listed there the main ones in Cumbria. Rothill is, I mentioned that, mentioned that one earlier, that was recorded from 1330. Um, Old Town, if you don't know it, is on the, the back road from Kirby Lonsdale to Kendall. Very small place now. So those were the, the main fairs in Cumbria. And, and some of them were dealing with cattle coming down from the north, like Brough, Appleby, Kirby Stephen, Kirby Lonsdale, Milthorpe, and, and the bottom four there, Ambleside and Kendall were dealing with cattle coming from within Cumbria itself, the western part of Cumbria, Cumberland and Lancashire north of the Sands. In North Craven, I've listed the, the known cattle fairs there. A little advert, 1857 for Settle. Gearstons, you know where that is, great close. If you're, well, see if he's maybe John Asher Jr. Not, not John Asher Jr., Mr. Asher Jr. Um, I don't know how well you know the Dales, but Gearstones is near Ribble Head. Great close just to the east of Malham Tarn. Bossmoor between Bordley and Threshfield. Skipton, High Bentham, which also had horse fairs. And I can remember the horse fairs in the... 1990s, early 1990s, they still have horse fairs. Settle, of course, in the in the marketplace. Brassington again in the marketplace. Clapham in that wide road going up from the Hill Inn, the, the Hill Inn, the New Inn, and in Malham Village. These were the main ones in North Craven. Bossmore took over when Great Close went into decline, and Great Close became just a fattening ground for the main. Uh, markets, the main fairs on Boss Moor. Very well organised system. And the way it worked was that word would be put out by whoever was running the fair or whichever of the places it was, that there would be a fair starting on the such and such of October or the such and such of September, like this advert there for Tettle. And the word would spread, you know, sort of virally, as it were, up and down the line. And uh, those drovers who wanted to get to those particular fairs or were near enough would, would, would land up having fattened the cattle up as they got nearer. Very well organised system. I have no idea who painted this. It looks as though it's about 1800. It's somewhere in the Highlands. Dramatic, typical, minus 1800 dramatisation of the mountains. But you can see there the cattle are virtually all black. The odd one rather dappled. You've got the drover there in his uh, with his filly bag, his plaid, waving his stick and tending his dog because three of the cows have decided they're going to go the way they want to go. He cannot, he may have been on his own. So it's difficult to tell how many cattle there are because there might be some off the painting to the right and some out of sight to the at the back of the, uh, the herd. But uh, not an easy job trying to herd cattle. 
A bit like herding cats, probably. Blah. All the dark black lines on there are drove roots. The circles are known gathering points at the start of droves. So if you go right to the top, Thurso, just south of Thurs Thurso. And there's another one in Strath. Can't read what it says. Got the wrong glasses on. Word would would get would be sent out from whoever was leading the drove. Let's take the one near uh, George Mus. Is George Mus? Um, word would go out that the drove was going to leave, you know, next week or whatever it was. And the farmers from that general area would bring their one or two or three or whatever it was cattle to there and entrust them to the drover who would then go south. And they would just go down those roads and obviously they'd meet other routes and blah, 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 blah. Go over to the top left of the map onto Harris there. You've got um, a route coming over by boat. Another one is coming from Lewis, which is off the map. There were other ones coming from the smaller islands. And I'm going to mention, if you go down to where the red number seven is, and there's a little place there, if you can see the print Kilcoan at the end of the road there in Ardnamurkin Peninsula. And the reason I am using that is not because John Asher's son lives in Ardnamurkin, it's because I happen to know that to, to send cattle from Barra, the Isle of, island of Barra, to Ardnamurkin by boat cost half a crown per head. This is in the 18th century. So the cattle were I don't it's some cattle from Barrow went up through South Uist and across to Skye. Some cattle from South Uist went down to Barrow and across to Adnamurkan. And we know from the records that they were landed, officially landed at Kilcoan, but there are one or two other bays there. Um I happen to have a map here that uh Mr. Asher Jr. will know them very well, I'm sure. American. Um, possibly Santa Bay or Port Uark, where they would have just gone near to a beach, not to a, a, a harbour or a, or a jetty, but just gone to uh, towards a beach, get near the beach. And then what they did, they would chuck one of the cows overboard and it would swim or paddle, depending on how deep the water was, to the shore. And once one had been chucked over, the rest would follow. And on the short island hops, they didn't use boats, they just swam them across. They just drove them into the water and they swam across. And all of those routes end up at the bottom there at Falkirk, which is right on the bottom of the map. And if you just go north from where it's from Falkirk, a bit, you've got Creef. So all those routes focused initially on Creef and after. 1970, they all focused on Falkirk. The next map takes that Scotland southwards into England and you sort of look at the number of routes there and compare it with what's coming up on the next map. Falkirk, they're now right at the top. You had a choice of one route out of Falkirk, at least initially, and then it split a little bit one through Linlithgow, one through Bathgate to um, join near living, what's now Livingston, and then went down mainly through Carlisle. Different routes. And then you've got the other route there coming from Ireland. Donaghadee was the main shipping point from there over to Port Patrick or Port Logan officially, and then driven through, right through what's now Dumfries and Galloway. And if you follow that line through Newton Stewart, through New Galloway, through Crockettford to Dumfries and keep going 
when you, before you get to Gretna, the road diverges. One goes to Gretna and then to Carlisle. Another one crosses the Solway Firth to Bowness. That was a major route crossing. They just walked and swam them across. And there was one dreadful tale of a drove with, I can't remember how many cattle there were, something like 200 and something cattle, and they mistimed the tides. The drovers mistimed the tides and they lost every single head that they were driving. So how they explain themselves to their, to their bosses, goodness knows, dreadful. And I've got a little note there, in 1746, to drive a, one beast from Galloway to East Anglia was cost a pound. That, that's what, that was the total expenditure, one pound per beast. That's a lovely little milestone that was just outside Thirsk. I was in Thirsk last year, actually, and I looked for it, but I couldn't find it, but the road has been widened, so it's probably been, I don't know, nicked or whatever. But we got the drover there with his stick and his uh, dog. That's what's now the A1. I mentioned Galway's Gates earlier, Galloway Gates, Scotch Driving Road, Scotch Lane, Old Scotch Road which is it's, it's still named on modern OS maps as Old Scotch Road. Uh, and if you know where to look, you find little markers like that one. If before it was, you know, formalized as a road and tarmac, there were just market stones. That's one of the market stones. And that's another one. And that is actually called the Galloway Stone. If you've driven from Shap through down to Autumn, the factory just before you go under the northbound carriageway the m6 which is just where pamela jordan is at the moment that's where that stone is so that the the, the, the draw if they were going down for the first time or hadn't been down for several years they would they would know what things to look out for and the galloway stone there was one thing so that's the route there's absolutely no trace of a road going past the galloway stone but that was a major drove route past there and a bit further on, this is in Dillica on the west side of the, uh, the Loon Valley. What you're looking at there was a drove road, but not with the walls and not with the hard surface. It is, you know, formalised in the enclosure movement. And that's more like what a drove road would have looked like for real. This is, um, the, you've got the bit of the motorway there, bottom middle left. Little left bit of the M6 there, just north of Killington Services. Now, if you come out of where on my screen Sheila Goodall is, there are two patches of sunlight, and those patches of sunlight are catching the sun because the ground there is flat. And if you go away from that corner towards the line of trees and more or less not quite dead center where the field drops down to the trees can you see there's like a shoulder a flat shoulder so that that from the two Sheila Goodall's husband's head those two patches there going to that shoulder before the trees that was the line of the old scotch road David you can use your cursor to point what a good idea there's, so it's coming along here. You can see the sort of flatness of it there. And then that's the shoulder I'm talking about. So the road comes around there. You, you would not know. If you didn't know, you would not know that had ever been a road. But it wasn't a road. It was a, it was a drove route. Um, this is the M6. This is Killington Lake. This is Killington Services. That's the bridge going over the motorway on the Sedba Road and the first farm right next to the motorway on the west side after that uh, junction there is Lambrig Park Farm. And it, it got, you can't see it really on this Google image, but it's got lots of little enclosures and Lambrig Park was an inn 
a drove in and also a stance. The stance is where, like on the Eden Hall estate, people could raise their cattle overnight and pay and get, you know, get sustenance overnight. And the Scotch Road, you know, take out the motorway, follow the curter, coming down this, this thin line, coming down here, coming down here, and then from this point downward, it's absolutely dead straight, all the way down. And that goes all the way down to Old Town. And that's part of it. Bit of a switchback. It's absolutely dead straight. Again, take out the tarmac, take out the walls. But that was one of the, on the western side of the Pennines, one of the, one of the two main drove routes in the north of England. Comes down dead straight for the curve. Absolutely dead straight. It comes to a farm called Three Mile House. And you've got these odd shaped fields. And Three Mile House, again, was a stance and a drover's inn. And then from there, it, it came, come, where did it come? Comes along here and, and went down there down to Old Town. When you get to Old Town, there's this, if you're coming from Kirby, Kirby Lonsdale, this is the first building on the left. That's a substantial set of buildings. That was the Durham Ox. Not sure why Durham Ox, because you wouldn't be driving cattle from Durham to, to here, but it was the Durham Ox. Again, it was an inn, a drover's inn, and, um, you know, stance. And if you go, so Old Town is, on the other photo there, is just down below those trees. And this is the road that goes from Kirby Lonsdale through Old Town and goes off towards Old Hutton and Kendall. And these, this area in here, these three fields in here, that strip there, it's local people still call it the fairground. Because this is where, when they had the big fairs, the big cattle fairs in Old Town, this is where they were held. Another major route coming down Westmoreland uh, came from <coughs> Appleby. Crosby Ravensworth, which is down in the trees there. It comes up, you've got this big funnel coming up. All sorts of hollowways coming over the top. Getting down eventually to T Bay and then coming along Fair Mile Road, which I'm sure you've driven on the east side of the loon. This is more like what a drove, take out the tower, but this is more like what a drove route would have looked like, just completely open. Because this, for the drovers, was free grazing. They could just let the cattle wander and graze and pay nothing for it. If they were contained within walls, they didn't have that. So this was the other main um, north-south drove route in this part of uh, the north of England. And that is supposed to be looking across to the Howgills in the distance there from the, the fur bank, the western side route there, and you've got cattle, different colours, you've got sheep, so it's a mixed drove. You've got the two chaps there, the one on the white pony, and the one at the back there looks as though he's on a more of a he's walking, he's actually on foot, so he's again he's the one on the on the pony is the boss. You've got the the plaids, the filly bags, sticks, a little droving team just taking five as they go. That's where my old car was parked there at the cattle grid. That's still called Fair Mile Gate um, on, on the old road. Very narrow. You, you, even, you know, take out the walls in places, quite narrow. They must have been really strung out. And there's a, a milestone there that says Kendall facing the camera, seven miles, said by two miles on the back of it. And on one other side, O, which is Autumn, seven miles to another, uh, either, oh God, another seven miles or ooh, only seven miles to go. Whatever. Another drove rope came down through Malastang, through Kirby Stephen, down right through Malastang to where the Moorcock is, in, is now, and then either went, turned left to Hawes and down Wensley Dale, or basically turned right and then straight over the top on what now Garsdale Station. And there's a little village of Owsgill, which had a pub. And that door head there, 1665, 
was the pubs have been demolished, but that's been rescued from that was on the main door of the pub. And loosely translating the Latin, it says, if you come here with good intent, you are welcome. If you come here with ill intent, sod off. Fine. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was um, a time getting to you. Um, I have. <laughs> Do you know the uh, the road, what's called the tank road, that goes from Redmire past Wensley Quarry up towards the uh, Catrick bases? And just before you turn left on a road which takes you to Richmond, there's a farm called Haypenny House. The farm is on the side of the road where I was standing when I took this photo. The building you can see there is actually a, a corn mill, a corn drying kiln, a corn mill. Um, but it's called Haypenny House because that farm was a stance and an inn. And the per head, per cattle head, B for grazing there overnight was a halfpenny. So you get halfpenny houses in several places. There's one just north of Kirby Stephen. Um, the drovers, the boss was the print called the principal, the dealer. He didn't go with the herd. He just wheeled and dealed at one end. Julian Clary, who you saw earlier, was the topsman. He was the um, the ramrod of rawhide. He got a salary plus commission. And if things went wrong, he lost his commission and he lost his pay. And he genuinely rode ahead to sort things out at the next stand or whatever. The actual cattle were in the hands of the people who were called the drovers. And generally speaking, one drover had 60 head. They were paid three between three shillings and four shillings per day. And then below the drover, there were the hands, the ones who walked. So the, the drover would probably have had a pony, the hands they walked. They got paid two and six pence per day and they got a total of 10 bob for the whole return journey from Smithfield to Scotland or wherever and if they had a dog it was an extra six per day and they would cover 20 to 25 kilometers per day 12 to 15 miles a day just try and maintain that slow it down some days quicken it up other days and I don't know I'm sure you've seen this before the counting system Every major dale, Arkengarth Dale, Swale Dale, Wensley Dale, Malastang, etc., etc., in Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, in Cumberland, in Westmoreland, in North Lancashire, they had variations on this theme. So one, two, three, four, five in this one, Yantan Tether Tether Pim, Tether Tether Hover Dover Dick, Yana Dick, Tether Dick, Tether Dick, Tether Dick, Bomfit, Yana Bomfit, Tether Bomfit, Tether Bomfit, Tether Bomfit, Gigit, twenty. Now, I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five in modern Welsh. In, die, three, pedwa, pimp. In, die, three, pedwa, pimp. So these, this numbering system has to have Cumbric or Britonic origins. Now, one of the questions I want someone to answer at the end is how would you say 21? How would you say 21? How am I doing for time, John? Is he mute? Yes, okay, David, you've done the hour. Um, oh. Nearly. Oh, Tell me to stop when you want me to stop. Well, uh, we're doing fine, I think, for the moment. Okay, people will start disappearing if they want to go to bed or whatever. <clears throat> right, this one or two, you know, we're going back to the romanticism. This is from the North Allerton Quarter Sessions in 1692. Gilling West, Gilling is in the uh, lower part of um, um, Wensleydale. So a drover from Caber 
you know where Caber is, was set upon and robbed by two men at Gilling West. He was on the drove going through and they stole from him that amount of money. That's a colossal amount of money in those days. Colossal. But they were apprehended, they were taken to the, to the quarter sessions, they went to trial and the, uh, the judge made what I think is rather a nice ruling. He said that the two men who robbed him, they'd obviously got rid of the money or hidden it or whatever. So the judge said that the, the area, the hundred of Gilling West must cough up £144, three shillings and sixpence and pay it back to the man who'd been robbed. So the whole community was forced to pay. I like that. Um, this is a quote, what uh, the average, particularly towards the end of the uh, drove, what the average drover or hand would look like, sort of think, what's that man with the big voices on TV? Oh, forgot his name. The great booming voice. Anyway, whatever it is. Um, was the life easy? Is this romantic? Scanty fare? Wet clothing a lot of the time, sleeping in damp dosses or in the open air, crossing rivers when they're in flood, marching for mile after mile after mile with, with very basic fare. It was a jolly hard life. And they, presumably the boys, or certainly not the, you know, the, the chap on the pony, but they had watchmen because it was very common, pads, you know, thieves, coming to, to steal the money, or stock thieves, rivalries between different, uh, I, I won't go through it, but I've got a case here involving two skips and drovers who um, were stealing each other's stock as they were going down, you know, each way. And for the first few days of a, of a drove, cattle have got a very strong homing instinct. If any of you have got farming interests, cattle, even if they're in a big field, they tend to go back to, very often they tend to go back to the same part of that field to spend the night. And these, the night watchmen, the night watch boys, had to make sure that the cattle didn't sort of head off back home at night, in the dead of night. What did they eat? Crowdy and black puddings and onions. Crowdy is um, sort of a kind of cream cheese eaten on oat cakes. Um, they had to feed, <coughs> the stances had to feed the cattle, they had to get food for their dogs, they had to pay the tolls. Just give me an example there of some tolls per 20 beasts. Pay for the stances, they had to pay if they stayed at an inn or, or a hedge alehouse, a very basic alehouse, they had to pay for that. If they overwintered somewhere like at Norfolk, they had to, on a joist, they had to pay for that. And they had to pay for medication for their other stuff. This is next slide is a wonderful little uh, recipe for cattle moraine from 1623. I'll let you read it. Doesn't say whether it's to be human urine or cattle urine or what. But I think the uh, the corollary get the corollary to that would be and run and hide. Cattle had to be shod. And this is my second question for you. <clears throat> in 1611, in what's now the Yorkshire Dales, one shoe cost one penny. In the late 19th century at Grassington, and Grassington for some reason was a major shoe, cattle shoe making centre, to, to shod a complete beast so my question is between 1611 and the late 19th century what was the rate of inflation for cattle shoes okay uh, on drovers inns this is Dorothy, Wor Dorothy Wordsworth wretched place more like a hog sty than an inn 
they were pretty basic places. But some examples that have survived, that's Stapleton is um, up towards Carlisle. I passed that way about three years ago and it was for sale. I drove in. Don't know what's happened to it now. Two there that are no longer in Glattonby and uh, Pack Horse and the drovers at Glattonby, which is at the foot of the Pennines in Cumberland. The drovers rest at Monkhill, which yeah. is still a pub. Even you know what? Highland Drove, Ditto at Great Salt Cove, North of Penrith. These are all genuine drovers' inns, or were. Um, the road from Kirby Stephen southwards down Malastang to the Moorcock, you go under the railway bridge at this farm, Shaw Paddock, and that was the Bull, that was the Drovers Inn, where two roads met. This is to the south of Addingham up on the moors, it's called Black Pots now. That's the old drove route. Take out the walls, as I've said. That was the Gaping Goose Drovers Inn. And we, we all know Gearston's. That's it taken about 1900. And those four there, in a state of various states of ruination, the one at the top left is was the Drovers, called the Drovers at Winterings. And Winterings is a little hamlet high above Gunnerside on the north side of the, the Twaledale, above the Gunnerside Gill. And uh, that was the Drovers. There's a route coming over the, over the top down to Gunnertide, so that was the drovers there. The one top right um, was is on the road. If you go on the little lane that goes from Hartley, just south of Kirby Stephen, over to Keld, the Burkdale, that's right by the roadside. Um, it's, uh, it shows various stages, but the middle bit is 17th century at the, uh, at the, at the latest. Great close bottom left there. It's near Malham Town, the pile of ruins there. Pile of rubble rather was the great, great close house, which was the, no doubt the den of iniquity, den of drunkenness, den of fighting whenever they had the cat affairs on great close in the late 18th century. And there was an inn called the Lone Head, which is long since gone on Boss Moor. Um, and next to it, there is that feature there, which is, only collapsed in the last two or three years, but I went in it some years ago. You go in, you went inside it and it became a T-shape and that was the cold store where they kept everything cold. Not an ice house, but a cold store, the Lone Head Inn. <clears throat> and my last slide, those are the reasons why drawing came to an end. Flip down them. I wonder how many of those need any, anything, need me to say anything. 13 left of Smithfield. Uh, this was in the sort of mid to late 19th century there. And this is a quote. The Smithfield fairs were brought to an end or, or almost brought to an end by quote, sentimental objections, witnessing distressed animals being herded through the city and slaughtered. Hygienic objections to blood, filth, and the smells associated with it. Not in my backyard, please. Um, I guess most of those are obvious. Turnpikes, of course, they had to pay tolls. They didn't want to do that because that took away their profits. Landowners closing roads when the enclosure came along, or just because they didn't want them. Turnips. Hmm, what the hell's turnips got to do with it? I lied when I said that was my last slide. The one next, that's the last slide. I'll let you read it. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, David. Um, we have had a few questions that have come in for you. Yeah. Uh, one of them is um, from Sue Arnott. Um, a couple of questions. What would have been the status of the drove roads 
Were they highways or did the drovers get permission to cross land? And was there any relationship between cattle droves and pack horse train trains? There was a, a book written, uh, published, I think in 1986, up at my bookshelf, Roads and Trackways of the Yorkshire Dales, um, which some of you might have. And it, it, it's a very good book, but he has different chapters. He has a chapter on pack horse roads, a chapter on drove roads, a chapter on and turnpike roads, etc., as though roads were unipurpose. They were not, they were multipurpose. So if a pack horse route coincided with a drove route, then they'd share the same route. If it didn't, then they wouldn't. Um, what was the status of drove roads? It varied. Now there was one road, um, I'll never find my piece of paper, one of the Scottish roads was actually constructed in, I think it was 1611, excuse me, uh, specifically as a drove road. Um, a lot of them, they, they kept away from enclosed land in the valleys and the valley side and tried to stay away. Like on the, on, on, you know, Fair Mile, they wanted free grazing, so they'd just go find a route They might, some of them would have been you know, the, 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 uh, the, the King's Roads, the King's Roads, the, the major roads, some of them would have been small lanes, but they, before enclosure, you could basically go where you want. So they try and stay away from enclosed land, because if they went through enclosed land, they'd be charged. They'd be charged, uh, you know, for a sort of passage through there. So, it, you know, it, it's, it depended where you are where you were in the country. And of course, in Scotland, where access was and still is much freer, much more open than it is in, in England, um, they could basically just go where they wanted to go. Okay. If that answers the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Geraldine asks, was each beast marked by its owner? Otherwise, how would he be paid at the end? They were marked. They were marked. So if, when they, if they were driven from somewhere in Scotland to, to say, to Creef and changed hands, then they get another, another, another um, brand on the men. And if they got to, to Malham and, and were sold again, then they get a third brand. So it was passed on. It was very, it was, you know, the records were very carefully kept. Okay. Um, and then Tim Quantrill asks, was it true money which was left at the inns for the dogs which were sent home on their own? <laughs> and John asks, when did banking come in to help with payments um, stroke save drovers carrying the cash? Um, taking the first one, that, that is a lovely story, isn't it? And for years and years and years, I thought, no, no way. There's no way. But in fact, I... And I, I was trying to find it for this talk, but I couldn't find it in my my squiddled away notes. When very often, when drovers got down to let's say Norfolk or Suffolk or even Smithfield, they would send the dog back, go home, and they would the, the drovers would go back by ship, you know, to whichever was the nearest port, Berwick on Tweed or somewhere in Edinburgh or wherever they were going to, Newcastle, whatever, and they would send the dog back. And the dog would go to the places where they'd stayed on its journey south. And the owner of that dog would have paid, each night coming down, would have paid the inn or whatever, a penny, a halfpenny, to feed the dog when it came back. So that is, it is, I found an actual reference to that, not, not from a, a secondary source, from, I found a primary source, and I wish I could we will find what it is because I can't remember when it was or, or where it was. Mm. What was the second mm. part of the question? I've forgotten. Um, the other one was uh, when did banking come in banking. to help payments to save drovers carrying cash? Um, early, I suppose early 18th century um, and I mean we, we if you live in Craven you all know about the Craven Bank it was in Settle the what's now Lloyd's Bank started off as exchanging the just promissory notes. There was the Black Ox Bank, um, there was the Black Horse Bank, 
which I suppose is what's now Lloyd, isn't it? The commercial bank, which became part of Bartlett's. These things started up in a small way because if you were like the chap who was robbed at Gilling, you were carrying 147 quid, or in some cases, carry maybe a thousand pounds if you were, you know, with a big drove. You, it was much better to get a large piece of paper as a promissory note, which became, in turn, you know, later times became a you know, banknote. Yeah. Great big things, but it would be, it really got going in the early 18th century. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Tim Quantrill also asks, is Scott Gate Lane that's east of Conistone an old drove road? Um, Scott Gate Lane. That's the one going over the top, isn't it? I think. I'm just trying to place Scott Gate Lane. If it's going east-west over the top, probably not. Yeah. Because the general direction was, was ever southwards. But I, I can't just place it, so I wouldn't like to be definitive about it, I'm afraid. Right. Um, so uh, Marianne and Phil McNichol ask, did the people who bought the cattle at the local fairs around here then drive them down south or were they bought for meat? It, it varied. We know um, for the Gearson's fairs, for example, that you had people coming from the Lancashire towns, the North Lancashire towns, the North East Lancashire towns, from Skipton, well, not North and Skipton, that's, they had their own fairs, um, from different parts of Wensleydale, from Ingleton, and some of them were butchers or dealers who were buying for butchers in the different towns. And they just drive whatever they they bought away. Some of them were sold on to dealers to be to be driven further south. So it's, again, it's a mixture. Okay, um, and they also ask why did Creef decline to be replaced by Falkirk? If you can sort of go back, not physically, but go back to the map. Some of the routes coming from the west had to go a little bit north to get to Crete and then to go south again. It wasn't as centrally placed as Falkirk. So Falkirk really was the a much better nodal point than was Crete. And I suppose there was an element of the people who were down in, in, in Falkirk wanted, wanted to make it work and put lots of money into it and, and you know, who knows what sort of school duggery and what else took place. But I think the basic reason, Falkirk could not have grown to be as important as it was if it hadn't been such a notable point. Okay. Um, uh, Margaret Dickinson is recommending The Drove, a DVD by Eric Robson, all about driving cattle um, from the Highlands down to Smithfield, if anybody's interested in that. Um, and then John is asking, do you have any info about an old well-preserved drove in above Malastang on the Lady Anne's Way, which seems to have a paddock attached for grazing? That's called High Dyke. You can see it from the road, can I? Sorry? If, 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 if you, you can see it from the railway line. Yeah. Yeah. Right up on the top. Mm. Yeah, it, that's High Dyke. There were three. There was High Dyke, High Hall and Horse Paddock up there. Um, there were certainly, I know that, I know that High Dyke, the one that you can see from down below, the ruins, that that was what's called a hedge alehouse. And if you want to know what a hedge alehouse was, you'll have to buy the book on Lost Inns. Um, that was where the drovers passed that way. I'd, I'd be surprised because there was a road that came down off that, down to um, the Bullet Shaw paddock. So it may, there may have been droving going along there, but it wouldn't have been a major road, but it was certainly a pack horse route, an important pack horse route. Okay, um, and there are some comments, if, if other people want to have a look on, on the chat thing, about Durham Ox is a common pub, pub name like the Craven Heifer. Um, uh, one is at High Psych, uh, and there's a horse pasture near one of them. Um, and then Jean Carr is saying that her grandfather, Moon, always used to call cattle B, Ass. Is that right, Jean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. And meaning yes. beef is the same word. Um, and somebody else, Joyce Thacker, is saying it came from Galloway and it's still used to describe cattle. Is that 
Have you heard that, David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Jean Hall tells us that Falkirk was the only place in Scotland where bagpipes were permitted after 1745. <laughs> so, <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> no <laughs> comments, please. <laughs> Has anybody else got anything else that they... Oh, we did have... It was Brian Blessed, the name of the... That's um, the one. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, and there were also some people about Trist. Um, it was from the Scottish language, synonymous with cattle fairs. Uh, and Robin also pointed out that it was um, a meeting place, like a lover's tryst. Um, so, and it was used both pre-1700s and post-1700s was the tryst, apparently. That was from Joyce Thacker, so, all right. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'd just like to thank you, Well, Dave. before that, I want to know what the rate of inflation was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, does anybody know what the rate of inflation was? And would they like to put their, unmute themselves to tell us? The 300th root of two. Say it again. 300th root of two. No, no. It was zero. 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 It was, it was a penny per shoe in 1611, and it was eight pence per beast in the 19th century. Cattle have eight shoes. Mm. We've got cloven hooves. So it was still a penny a shoe. So there was no inflation. And... My, my question, how did they say 21? Anybody work uh, that out? Yana Gigit. No. No. Gigit no. 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 <laughs> no. There was no number 21. Oh. Because the drovers had a stick and a knife. And as they counted the animals going past them, when they got to 20, they put a score on their stick, 20, and started again from Jan, and put another score, and another score, and that's why 20 is called a score. Oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then why, why did I uh, put a, 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 an American picture in, in my my title page anybody come up with that, that? Be, that because they they emigrated after the railways the drovers emigrated to scotland uh, from scotland to um to America and became cowboys or not it it's yeah it's so many people were driven out of the highlands not just in you know the 1740s but for how, how many hundred years at least after that a lot of them went across to america and because they've been used to drive to droving in in scotland and england they were natural people to become, you know, so-called cowboys. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, what a lot of nice questions. Oh, thank, you. Oh, thank you, David. Uh, it has been such a fascinating talk. Um, and I think you've been able to show us just how important this trade was and, and how it affected, you know, so many rather than just the drovers, you know, the, the communities where they... Where they were grazing them and, and um, where they were staying, these inns and things, um, and um, all the the regulations, which I had no idea that there was. It was such a regulated industry. Yeah. Sort of yeah. rather thought they just sort of set off with them and sort yeah. of walked them down. So it was absolutely fascinating, um, and I'm I'm sure everybody else has felt the same. I've learned so much from it, and uh, it's been excellent. So well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you David. Thank you. Your first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David. Thank you, David. Right. It's bedtime now. <laughs>